Our heart, lungs, and kidneys keep us alive, but the brain coordinates it all. The brain is the most energy-consuming organ in our body. It sends and receives electrical impulses along a vast network of billions of neurons that control our thinking, our language, and our emotions. Despite dramatic scientific progress, the way that the brain works still remains much of a mystery. At the University of California, Davis, a team of true brainiacs at the Center for Neuroscience is working to unravel that mystery. They are trying to understand the causes of mental diseases such as schizophrenia and dementia. We've learned more in the last, say, decade than the entire history of the world. But where we are right now in terms of understanding how the brain works and how the visual system works is probably where the Wright brothers were in aviation. You know, every time I look at the brain, it is uh, just an awesome experience. You see this uh, organ glistening, white, pulsating, and uh, it's, it, it's, it's awe-inspiring. And at the same time, we realize how little we know of how that stuff really works. The Center for Neuroscience is home to 25 faculty members who are considered basic research scientists. These PhDs work closely with medical doctors and surgeons who patiently wait for breakthroughs in the laboratory. Basic scientists bring this very important fundamental understanding um, to, the, um, to the MDs so that they can then translate that into the clinical health. It's kind of like from bench to bedside and try and the better integrated we could be, the more effective treatments will emerge. Sacramento area brain surgeon Praveen Prasad says the collaboration between the scientists in the lab and the surgeon in the operating room is critical. We're entirely dependent on basic research. There's very little that neurosurgeons actually do to advance treatment. Okay, we, we perfect surgical techniques, but mostly we're applied scientists. We take what is learned in the neuroscience laboratories and bring it to treatment of human beings, but the real core, the real hard work is really done by the neuroscientists in basic labs. Come on, sixes. One of the most devastating effects of dementia is the loss of memory. Four million Americans currently suffer from Alzheimer's, and experts say it is expected to quadruple in 30 years. Lucky five is our last Yahtzee. It's not just older people who suffer memory loss. Those who have had strokes and heart attacks, as well as those who have psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia and depression, can experience memory lapses. The more we can learn about the brain and the way the brain is wired to do normal memory, the more we can figure out how to improve those functions so we can use our knowledge of the brain to help us come up with better ways to improve memory, both in terms of finding different kinds of drugs, for instance, but also in terms of different kinds of training procedures that people can do to exercise their brain in certain ways. Sharon Ranganath's team of scientists is looking at the parts of the brain that are important for forming memory. Thanks in part to advances in neuroimaging technology, researchers can look at the brain while it thinks. For example, his team has been studying the little strokes that people suffer as they get older. So little, they may not even notice them. But it turns out that these little strokes are actually very preventable in the sense that it's like you can treat hypertension which increases your risk factors dramatically. There's things like diabetes which increase your risk factors. Uh, exercise is something you can do to actually reduce your risk for these kinds of strokes. And so I think this is a, is a big breakthrough that we've made. By targeting certain regions of the brain that process information, Ranganath's team is developing a program that will help us all improve our memory. Getting answers at the basic research level has also helped to Carly's Alzheimer's team at the UC Davis Medical Center understand what happens to brain function for those who suffer this type of dementia. In the last five to ten years we've learned what enzymes lead to the creation of this abnormal protein. We learned that it's the accumulation of this abnormal protein that's, that kills the brain cells. By removing this abnormal protein, DeCarly says doctors may be able to slow the progressive nature of Alzheimer's. Research scientists are also finding clues that help explain how other diseases affect memory and thinking. We used to think, okay, you got the heart, you got the kidney, you got the brain, and they're not, they're all different, you know, organs. You got the skin, you got the bones, but in fact, the heart is connected to the brain because the brain needs the blood from the heart, and the vessels that get atherosclerosis affect the brain.
And we know this now very, very clearly. And so general health, a healthy body is a healthy brain. And you can see where the synapses are. At the Kim McAllister's lab is a busy place. Postgraduate and graduate students work shoulder to shoulder in cramped corners learning about how the brain's chemical messengers work. To control thought and movement, the brain sends and receives electrical impulses by way of a vast network of neurons. These impulses use chemical signals to leap across the gaps between neurons. 10, 15 years ago, I would have said, there's no way in my lifetime that we would ever be able to identify that. And now I think I can safely say without exaggerating that within my lifetime, I think that we're going to see tremendous um, increases in treatments for disorders like Alzheimer's disease or traumatic brain injury and a much better understanding of neurodevelopmental disorders that are incredibly complicated like autism or schizophrenia. McAllister says her efforts to explore the brain's engine are buoyed by tapping into the mind of other researchers here at the center. The center structure here is really, really unique because what it does is it brings people with very different backgrounds and very different approaches to neuroscience questions together in one area which allows us to interact and it's those informal interactions that really lead sometimes to um, the most productive and exciting collaborations. Senior scientist Leo Chalupa has been an international leader in learning how vision works, how a visual system develops, and why disorders of the visual system occur. He is hopeful that in the next decade, we will get a cure for many of the diseases that impact the aging eye. But that progress could be hindered by shrinking financial support for vital research. Less than 10% of research grants by the NIH are funded. Five years ago, it was 30%. So what it means is about 90% of very, very good science, and I know because I've sit on these grant panels and I've chaired them in the past, did not get funded. So the way it works now is if reviewers feel a given research project is very, very good, it won't get funded. That's not good enough to get funded. You have to have reviewers say it's extraordinary. And the bad thing, the worst thing about this is that the young people who have entered the field, who are doing spectacular work, who have been trained in the very best places, and we've hired people like that in my department and other departments at UC Davis, really are competing in, a, in an environment where you have to be not very good, not outstanding, but extraordinary to get money. Despite the economic realities, this UC Davis Center is a den of activity. This is a, an awesome, just an absolutely sterling group of researchers that uh, I, I just see huge things coming out of that lab. The activity predicts how well they'll remember these things later on. But not Building knowledge about the biology of mental life is what the UC Davis neuroscientists do every day. With teamwork and an unending thirst for knowledge, they believe that what they discover will help us to live healthier lives.